TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Hello and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem. And in today's top stories... The IDF pledges to unceasingly hunt down Hamas leaders and operatives who participated in the October 7th massacre. Iran, Russia and China hold a joint naval exercise in the Gulf of Oman. The Iranian proxy on Sa'allah, which is dominated by the Houthi tribe, persists in its unwavering attacks against commercial shipping in the Red Sea. The Israel Defense Forces continue to eliminate Hamas operatives and degrade terror infrastructure throughout the northern, central, and southern parts of the Gaza Strip. Moreover, in a yet-to-be-corroborated outcome of an attack, the IDF and ISA increasingly believe that a targeted strike had successfully eliminated arch-terrorist Mawan Issa, deputy head and strategic mastermind of Hamas's Izzar Din al-Qassam brigades. We are still reviewing the strike's results, and a final confirmation has not yet been received. Nevertheless, it is important to update that on the night between Saturday and Sunday, in a joint operation by the IDF and the ISA, fighter jets attacked an underground compound of senior Hamas officials in the center of the Gaza Strip, in the Nuzirat sector. The subterranean complex was used by two of the organization's top officials, including Marwan Issa, who was the deputy of Mohammed Def and one of the orchestrators of the October 7th massacre. Marwan Issa is part of the central terrorist triangle in the Gaza Strip, which also consists of Mohammed Def and Yehya Sinwar. In addition to him, Ghazi Abu Tama was also at the underground compound during the strike. Ghazi Abu Tama formerly served as the commander of the Central Camps Brigade, and today, he serves as the person responsible for all of Hamas's armaments in Gaza. Moreover, additional terrorists were present next to Issa and Tama in the underground complex. Admiral Hagari further asserted, according to all of the intelligence indications at the IDF's disposal, no hostages were present in the referred to subterranean complex at the time of the attack. Moreover, while the intelligence community continues to evaluate the success of its latest attack, Admiral Hagari voiced an unequivocal pledge vis-à-vis -vis the Islamist Hamas. Rest assured, we will continue to pursue the leaders of Hamas and all those who were involved in the massacre on October 7th. We will hunt them down, and not only in Gaza. We have a great deal of determination, and we also have patience. Eliminating senior Hamas officials is a central effort of the war. While the Muslim observed month of Ramadan entered into its second day, Admiral Hagari unveiled that a joint operation by the RDF's elite of Devan unit in cooperation with ISA and Border Police Special Operators, managed to thwart an act of terror emanating out of the northern Samaria region. In Judea and Samaria, all security agencies work around the clock in close cooperation as part of preparations for Ramadan. A short time ago, Dovdevan, Shin Bet and Israel police special operators foiled a terrorist who came out of Jenin and was on his way to Israeli territory to carry out an attack in the immediate future, with both a weapon and a ready-to-use bomb were in his possession. We will continue to thwart terrorism anywhere in Judea and Samaria and along all of our borders. And Instead of enabling a humanitarian ceasefire for Ramadan, Hamas consciously chose to thwart any attempt to reach an agreement that would have led to the release of hostages, for a ceasefire in the fighting and the possibility of a peaceful Ramadan in Gaza. Hamas chose otherwise. Hamas is now trying to set the area on fire, among others, by means of false propaganda disinformation and incitement with an emphasis on social networks. We are deployed in the field with many forces for defense and our countermeasures will be increased in the face of all attempted attacks. We work, first and foremost, to maintain security, but also alongside our desire to allow freedom of worship during Ramadan, within the scope of security and safety limitations. While Israel works tirelessly to confront the threats of terror, the U.S. Annual Threat Assessment Report of the U.S. Intelligence Community was published and subsequently deliberated at a hearing of the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. In contrast to previous years, however, and in what was characterized by former U.S. intelligence officials as highly irregular, 
The declassified document questioned Netanyahu's viability as a leader, as well as his governing coalition, noting the possibility of a different and more moderate government. And while as noted, such assessments in public setting are highly irregular, particularly when deliberating a democratically elected government of an allied nation that is embroiled in war, the chairman of the U.S. Senate's Committee on Intelligence, namely Mark Warner, used a document's irregular assessment as a prelude to his personal contempt and that of the leadership of the Biden administration for Premier Netanyahu's unrelenting policy, which quite evidently frustrates President Joe Biden. And as we convene this hearing, we also face continued instability in the Middle East. The horrific terrorist attacks against Israel civilians by Hamas on October 7th have been followed by an incursion by Israel that has cost an estimated 30,000 Palestinians their lives. And while Iran and its key partners, such as Hezbollah, appeared to be deterred from widening the conflict for now, other Iranian proxies, such as the Houthis in Yemen, and Iraqi Shia militias have attempted to expand their conflict and drag in our country. At the same time, Israel's war against Hamas has shown the difficulty of using military force alone to eradicate a non-state actor embedded in a civilian population, especially one that has been so adept at using underground tunnels. And I worry that Prime Minister Netanyahu's conduct in the war threatens to undermine support for Israel in the long term, including in the United States. This international support has been key to Israel's security. While the wording of this year's intelligence assessment clearly took into consideration the policies pursued by the Biden administration, Vice Chairman of the Committee on Intelligence, Mark Rubio, pushed back on efforts to distance the Islamic Republic of Iran from the decision by Hamas to launch its deadly onslaught on October 7th. In the case of Iran, they want to export their Shia Islamic revolution to the entire Middle East. And the problem with this is two things standing in their way, the state of Israel and the United States of America. And so that is why they have proxy groups in places like Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Gaza, who they use for their purposes. One of their purposes is to use these groups now to attack Americans so that we will say it's not worth the trouble, we need to get out of there. And once we leave, then they'll move on Jordan and on Bahrain. Then they'll make Israel an unlivable place and ultimately their ambitions are the entire region and most of the Gulf kingdoms. That's why I think it's a mistake to view the hor horrific events of October 7th as simply the latest iteration of a long-standing Israeli-Palestinian problem. It is deeply tied to the head of this snake, and the head of this snake is in Iran and in Tehran. Meanwhile, CIA Director Bill Burns in his testimony reported to the Intelligence Committee on his latest efforts to hammer out an outline for a ceasefire that would include the release of roughly 40 hostages. Sure. Um, uh, for the last few months, uh, since uh, the last hostage return and ceasefire in the latter part of November, the president's been working very hard to try to renew that process. And I've traveled eight times to meet with my Israeli, Egyptian, and Guttery partners um, and returned most recently on Saturday night from the last such trip. What's on the table right now is a potential agreement that has three main elements. The first would be the return of uh, about 40 hostages. These are the remaining women hostages, uh, older men, and hostages who are wounded or seriously ill as the first step, as the first phase toward the return of all of the hostages, to which I know the president is deeply committed. Um, and that would be in return for a defined number of Palestinian prisoners held by the Israelis. The second element um, is um, uh, a ceasefire of at least six weeks, um, again, as the first step toward what might be more enduring arrangements over time. Um, and then the third element would be a major surge in humanitarian assistance, which under the circumstances of a ceasefire could actually be distributed effectively to people who so deeply need them. Um, so we're gonna continue to work hard at this. I don't think anybody can guarantee success. What I think you can guarantee is that the alternatives are worse. 
for innocent civilians in Gaza who are suffering under desperate conditions, uh, for the hostages and their families um, who are suffering also under very desperate conditions, and for all of us. Director of National Intelligence Avril Haines, for her part, used the deadly war in Gaza, which Hamas had launched against Israel on October 7th, as a stark example of how regional developments have the potential for broader and even global implications. This crisis in Gaza is a stark example of how regional developments have the potential for broader and even global implications. Now, having lasted for more than five months, the Gaza conflict has roiled the Middle East with renewed instability, presenting new security paradigms and humanitarian challenges while pulling in a range of actors. The conflict has prompted new dynamics, even as it has entrenched old ones. We continue to assess that Hezbollah and Iran do not want to cause an escalation of the conflict that pulls us or them into a full-out war. Yet the Houthis entered the war and were willing to do so without Iran acting first, becoming one of the most aggressive actors in the conflict. And the Iranian-aligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria that have been attacking our forces and have been more focused on the United States than Israel, using the conflict as an opportunity to pursue their own agenda. Moreover, the crisis has galvanized violence by a range of actors around the world, and while it is too early to tell, it is likely that the Gaza conflict will have a generational impact on terrorism. Both al-Qaeda and ISIS, inspired by Hamas, have directed supporters to conduct attacks against Israeli and U.S. interests, and we have seen how it is inspiring individuals to conduct acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobic terror worldwide. While deliberations at the Committee on Intelligence hearing focused primarily on threats emanating from the southern border of the United States, China, Russia, and to a lesser degree, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the three latter actors held a naval exercise in the Gulf of Oman in what Moscow, Beijing, and Tehran highlighted aims to bolster maritime cooperation with a shared future in mind. The exercise will help strengthen exchanges and cooperation between the navies of China, Iran, and Russia, and further demonstrate their willingness and ability to jointly maintain maritime security and build a maritime community with a shared future. While well, Russia, China, and Iran speak of jointly maintaining maritime security, Tehran's proxy in Yemen continues to target international maritime shipping, essentially causing extensive disruptions to freedom of navigation in the strategic strait of Bab el Mandeb and adjacent waterways. <laughs> The naval forces of the Yemeni Armed Forces, with the help of Allah the Almighty, carried out a targeting operation against the American ship Pinocchio in the Red Sea with a number of appropriate naval missiles, and the hit was accurate. A ship tracker on the London Stock Exchange Group's official website showed the path of the targeted Pinocchio vessel in the Red Sea where it appears to have taken a U-turn after reaching the southern boundary of the Red Sea, namely near the coast of Yemen. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. It is important to highlight that TV7 Israel is a donation-based non-profit ministry with all of our productions available free of charge. Therefore, we would appreciate it if you would consider making a donation, and you can do so by visiting our website at www.tv7israelnews.com. Separately, I'd like to encourage you, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Essen, wishing you an Erev Mevorach, and God willing, we'll see you during our upcoming TV7 Israel updates. Until then, Shalom from Jerusalem.